Thanks to everybody who asked questions. This is part two of four. Many of the answers are in videos I've done in the past. You can find past videos by going to eagerspace.net and searching around. On to the questions. Is this recent boom in spaceflight and launches temporary, or will interest continue to grow? It's all about the constellations right now. SpaceX is obviously flying Falcon 9 to death for Starlink, and Amazon is hoping to fly a ton for Kuiper, and there are others interested, including the U.S. Department of Defense. Starlink is making enough money now that it's self-supporting and will probably keep expanding, but it's still possible that Kuiper and others could fail. Do you have any recommendations for other space-related YouTube channels that you enjoy? No. I really don't want to be derivative, and therefore I watch very little space-related YouTube. I will watch Everyday Astronaut when it's a topic I'm never going to cover. I generally avoid Scott Manley because we have similar topics. You should, however, watch or listen to Main Engine Cutoff and Off Nominal. Both are great. Realistically, how will SpaceX design the cargo door for the commercial variant of Starship so that it maximizes space? Lots of design options here. The payload area of Starship isn't highly stressed as the only force it carries is from the payload section structure and the header tank. What are the factors that would make off-Earth industrialization, moving a meaningful percentage of economic activity off-Earth, economically sensible? Is it a question of if, will it ever make economic sense, or when? It will probably make economic sense at some point, but we don't know when. This would probably require a full video to explore. The challenge is that there is nothing in space when it comes to infrastructure. It's like the Western world before the Industrial Revolution. You need to solve the same basic problems from that time. How to obtain materials, how to process the materials into something useful, how to power these processes, etc., etc. So far, we don't have any commercial product that makes sense to create in space. NASA has spent 20 years looking for that killer app, but so far, it doesn't exist. Maybe if launch becomes a lot cheaper, maybe then there's a useful application. Is any serious research being done on more futuristic rocket designs right now? For example, the various kinds of nuclear propulsion. Under what timeline do you imagine people getting interested in developing these new technologies? There are a lot of ideas that I covered in my crazy nuclear rocket engine series. The only one that seems practical is nuclear thermal propulsion, which NASA and the DOD have a project on right now. I don't expect much from it. My generic comment is that you can't find anybody who is willing to spend their own money trying to develop these technologies. Do you play KSP? Are space simulator games the best avenue for getting the new generation excited about space? I own KSP, but I've only played it a few times. Not really my kind of game, apparently. Anything that gets people doing spacey things is good. Why hasn't SpaceX developed a Hydrolox engine? Merlin was Carolox because there were lots of RP-1 engines out there which meant lots of prior art, and the quick and cheap way to get an engine was good enough. Raptor started out as a Hydrolox engine, but during development, SpaceX decided that Methalox made more sense. That means they looked at all the trade-offs and decided that Hydrolox was the inferior choice for Starship. The biggest problem with Hydrolox for a rocket like Starship is that it would have to be a much bigger rocket. Plus, Hydrogen is famously hard to work with and hard to build a high thrust engine out of. Orbital refueling is coming, plus Starship cargo version equals private space yachts might be a thing in 2032. True or false? False. Let me count the ways. Refueling seagoing yachts is pretty simple because all seagoing boats are at the same level and it doesn't cost a lot to get fuel from land to wherever the boat is. It's very energy intensive to get from one orbit to another in space. You just don't pull into a port someplace or request somebody to come out and refuel your space yacht. The second issue is one of market. 
It's not clear who would buy such a thing, and therefore it's hard to create a business plan where a company can make money doing this. Will we ever see boosters flying from production to launch sites, or is transportation just that much cheaper via boats or roads? Probably. I talk about it here. Why does the International Docking System standard use inward-facing alignment pedals instead of the outward-facing pedals of APAS-75 as used on the Apollo-Soyuz mission? I'm far from an expert on this, but my understanding is that they wanted a standard that would work with smaller vehicles. Do you think Vulcan will be able to reuse its BE-4 engines by the end of the year or next year? No way in 2025 unlikely in 2026. They need to focus on flying the NSSL backlog right now. If you got a free ticket for three days in a space hotel that has Earth-equivalent spin gravity, or could pay $5,000 to go to a scientific orbital station with no spin for three days instead, which would you go for? Weightless. Even if I knew I would be space sick. Given European aspirations to decouple their military reliance on the U.S. and their near-current complete lack of space assets, how do you see this impacting the launch market? Not sure what you mean by near-complete lack of space assets. Both Ariane 6 and Vega C are flying, and ICER and Rocket Factory Augsburg are likely flying this year. Europe is in the midst of finishing their Galileo navigation constellation and will then be launching their second generation satellites starting next year. If they want to decouple in terms of satellites and military capability, it's going to take a few years to get their own satellites made, but they can certainly launch them. What would have prevented ULA reverse engineering the RD-180 after Russia invaded Ukraine? Pratt & Whitney had a license to build the RD-180 in the U.S., and reportedly ULA talked to them, and the price that Pratt & Whitney wanted to set up manufacturing had the word billion in it. ULA wasn't an engine company, and they'd have to convince somebody to do any reverse engineering for them. A second issue is that ULA really wanted to go from two rockets to one rocket. The RD-180 was about 3,800 kilonewtons of thrust, and the two BE-4 that they settled on for Vulcan are about 4,800 kilonewtons of thrust. That would argue that the RD-180 wasn't quite big enough. The current Vulcan design can barely meet the NSSL requirements. Why was a Saturn V capable to fly to the moon and back in one go, but Starship needs multiple refueling sessions? What if Saturn V tech would be used to do the Starship maneuver to the moon? Would it require the same amount of fuel? The Apollo spacecraft and lander were highly optimized to be as light as possible and do one specific job. SLS and Orion weren't designed for a moon mission, and Block 1 can't carry a lander. Not that Congress appropriated money to build one. So SLS Orion can only put Orion into a weird near rectilinear halo orbit because Orion was designed for the previous generation, the constellation architecture, not the Artemis architecture. Orion is also a bit of a pig when it comes to mass. HLS Starship and Blue Moon get a really difficult job. Get a lander all the way to the moon, to the lunar surface, and then back to near rectilinear halo orbit. It's a harder job than what the Saturn V did. There's been back and forth on possibly using offshore launch facilities for Starship. I wrote about Starship booster catches on drone ships. I don't think they're likely. I can see offshore being useful, but getting propellants and payloads there is a significant logistical issue. Do you think SpaceX will really be able to launch Starship without a launch abort system? Go watch this, and then go watch this. NASA happily flew astronauts on shuttle for years, despite having no good idea how risky it was. Does all of the ISS need to deorbit? Surely there's some used for the modules that weren't built in the 1980s. NASA did a great white paper on this, and I talk about it in this video. What's your position on Amazon Kuiper? It seems that they are moving really slow. Skeptical. You may have noticed that I haven't done a video on Kuiper. I generally don't invest the time until there's actually real hardware out there, or it's doing something unique or new. But here are a few thoughts. 
their launch costs are probably six to eight times what SpaceX is spending. It's not clear what happens when they miss their FCC deadline. Starlink has a ridiculous first mover advantage. Amazon isn't designed to run this kind of program. I don't think that paints a very good picture. I could maybe see Apple doing something, however. What happens if SpaceX decides they want to skip the moon? Aren't those contracts largely paid already? It's not clear what happens from my reading of the contract. I do think this is something that NASA really didn't think deeply about in their rush towards fixed price contracts, especially like this with huge development costs. NASA may need Starship more at this point than Starship needs NASA, though SpaceX clearly would like NASA cooperation to do Mars. We saw something similar in 2023 when Collins Aerospace said, thanks, but no thanks, and dropped out of their development contract for ISS spacesuits. And yes, most of the first contract money for HLS Starship has already been paid to SpaceX, though there is the Artemis IV contract that SpaceX would presumably like to collect on. This is very different from the commercial crew contracts where all the real money was in the operational flights. What do you think of the Orion capsule, its utility in low Earth orbit versus lunar, and other deep space missions like Mars proposals using it as a launch and reentry vehicle, and justifications for its existence at all. Go watch this. What car would you have launched to space on the Falcon Heavy demo flight? Pretty obviously, a 1971 Citroen SM in Euro trim with steerable headlights and a 3-liter engine from Maserati. Is it technically, if not economically, feasible to build nuclear pulse propulsion rockets like Project Orion or Medusa? Technically feasible, Sure. Practical in any other way? Not at all. The Atomic Rockets website has a lot of info on Orion. What are your thoughts on nuclear propulsion, NERVA, or Orion drives? Could these be implemented on future rockets, perhaps variants of Starship? You should probably watch my video on the NASA Nuclear Propulsion Program. It's been over 50 years since the NERVA tests in the 1960s, and during that time, none of the nuclear propulsion advocates have been willing to spend their own money developing the technology. That's generally a sign that there's not a lot of there there. Technically, nuclear thermal drives have high specific impulses, but they are heavy, need heavy shields, may not have great reliability, and are radioactive as hell once you turn them on. I don't think they're worth it. The Atomic Rockets website has a ton of useful information about nuclear propulsion. Do you think Starship will fly with Raptor V3 engines before Starship reaches orbit, defined as greater than one complete orbit? My guess is it will probably get there before Raptor V3 flies, but it's not at all clear when Starship 3 shows up, so it could easily go the other way. What's your estimation on the size of the orbital refueling economy? Right now, the current size is pretty close to zero. There are some commercial lifetime extension programs for geosynchronous satellites. I don't see a lot of architectures where orbital refueling makes much sense. The problem is that you need to choose a useful location for your propellant depot, and that location depends on where you're launching from and what your target goal is. Can you do a video on Gerald Bull's Project Harp, Project Babylon, etc.? The remains of the harp gun might still be in Barbados. I have a guns to space video that has some information about harp. I don't think it's likely I'll do another one, unless you want to send me to Barbados. My guess is that it would probably take a month to do enough research for a video. Opinions, thoughts on possible SLS cancellation. Is Starship viable enough to replace it? Was it ever needed in the first place? Is Orion dead? I talk about this in two previous videos, the old Commercial Moon Program one, and the recent one about how NASA may evolve with Isaacman as administrator. My general comment is that Artemis works only if Starship or Blue Moon work as landers. Both of those landers are more capable when it comes to Delta V than SLS and Orion, so you can certainly figure out how to do moon missions without SLS and Orion. SLS was a reaction to Constellation not being a viable program, and Congress just told NASA to build a big-ass rocket out of shuttle parts 
and to keep working on Orion. There was no associated mission until much later. SLS Orion did a good job of doing what Congress wanted, but it's so expensive that you can't afford to fly it enough to build a real exploration program out of it. And that's all for this chunk of questions. If you enjoyed this video, listen to this.